Good afternoon. Welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about emerging viruses. What is an emerging virus? Well, we define it as the causative agent of a new or previously unrecognized infection. So you can have a brand new virus that you've never seen before or a virus you've known causing something different or a virus that's been there and suddenly you're recognizing it. This term was introduced in the 90s, but of course emerging viruses are not anything new. Ever since the rise of agriculture, new infectious agents have invaded human populations. Why? Because the populations have become large enough to sustain infectious agent transmission. Before agriculture and commerce, humans were hunter-gatherers. They lived in small communities, didn't support much infection. Certainly there were infections introduced into those small communities. They didn't typically spread beyond them, and no one, of course, knew about them. And this idea of an emerging virus became popularized became something to investigate because we got the technology to detect these emerging viruses. And of course, the popular press is very interested in emerging viruses as witnessed by this 1995 Newsweek cover on Ebola virus. An emerging virus can be a virus with an expanded host range or an increase in disease that we didn't previously notice. So for example, Zika virus was discovered in 1947. However, it wasn't until 2015 that we recognized that that mosquito transmitted flavivirus could cross the placenta and cause microcephaly and other congenital birth defects. Now we have a term embedded in the idea of emerging viruses, that is zoonosis. A zoonosis is the transmission of a virus from a wild or domesticated animal to humans. We'll use this uh, many times today. You'll get to understand it a little better. SARS-CoV-2 was a zoonosis at one time. It came from a non-human animal to a human, but now it's no longer a zoonotic virus. It is a human virus. Sometimes a zoonotic infection or a cross-species infection, sometimes we call it a spillover from a non-human to a human, sometimes this establishes a new virus in the population. Simian immunodeficiency virus, for example, moving from chimps to humans in the 1920s. We'll talk about that in its own lecture. SIV was not a human virus. When it infected the first humans, it was a zoonotic infection. Then it became a human virus. And of course, SARS-CoV-2, as I've just said. Now, in contrast to these zoonotic spillovers that eventually become human viruses, often cross-species infection can't be sustained. For example, Ebola viruses continuously spill over from bats to humans, but the chains of transmission eventually end, and the next outbreak is a brand new spillover. Same thing with MERS coronavirus from camels to human. Every infection is a brand new spillover. Same thing with West Nile virus. Every time a mosquito transmits its to human, it's a spillover from a bird to human. And this book, Fever, about Lassa virus, Lassa infections continue to this day. Each one is a spillover from a rodent reservoir to a human. Each one is a spillover. It doesn't go from person to person. Yet there's so many initial spillovers that it's a problem. Every human virus that we have today originated in a non-human source. We mentioned this last time. I want to emphasize this again with this graphic where we're looking on the y-axis at the viruses belonging to the number of genera. These numbers here are genera that harbor viruses of different sorts. First on the left, 31. Viruses belonging to 31 genera are human viruses. This includes measles, herpes viruses, mumps virus, rhinoviruses, all right? These are human viruses. They once originated in animals, but now they're human viruses. Viruses belonging to 37 
genera are zoonotic pathogens. They spill over from zoonotic sources like MERS coronavirus, like Lassa virus, like Ebola virus, Nipah, Hendra. They're all brand new spillovers. They don't transmit very well from human to human. And then the remainder, 16 viruses belonging to 16 genera we inherited. Homo sapiens inherited from its hominin ancestors, like Australopithecus had a virus that was transmitted down through all the descendants eventually to Homo sapiens. So 16 of those. And then finally, six came from Homo species, like Homo neanderthalensis. So that's the, the ancest ancestral sources. Now, these last numbers here, uh, these primates, of course, obtained them from animals. So it's not like they developed in them. They're all from non-human animals. The biggest overriding factor that drives the emergence of infectious diseases, not just of us, but of animals as well, is human population growth, as evidenced by this amazing graphic where it's just shot into the billions quite recently. And, of course, accompanied Accompanying this population growth, amazing change occurring in all ecosystems as we inhabit every corner of the planet, and we introduce changes that alter the ecology. We'll talk more about ecological issues next time, and we make encounters with viruses more and more frequent. And these are some of the ecological and anthropogenic activities that promote virus emergence. Another way to say this is humans continuously devise new ways to encounter viruses from our hunter-gatherer ancestors. They lived in very small groups of 100 or 200 people that moved around when the food ran out. They encountered some wildlife and got perhaps infections from them to now we have amazing global travel networks. This is a website where you can see all the airplanes in the air at any given time. A virus can go around the world very quickly. We also do other things that increase our ability to become infected with viruses that were previously not in us. Dams, water impoundments have led to so many new viruses emerging as the dam creates new environments for different hosts of viruses, deforestation, rerouting migration patterns, wildlife park, long-distance transport of livestock and birds. People want to buy exotic pets. Wow, they come with their own viruses. Blood transfusion, xenotransplantation, sexually transmitted viruses, drug abuse. And of course, there's air travel, urbanization, daycare centers is a recently devised uh, in invention, which is a good way to get lots of kids together and share their viruses, then bring them home to their parents, hot tubs, improperly sanitized, spreading viruses, air conditioning, and millions of used tires, of course, which we talked about transporting little bits of water to harbor mosquitoes and climate change, and even natural disasters alter uh, the viruses that are around. Climate change, of course, changing ecosystems and increasing the spread of mosquitoes, just for a few examples there. So these are the ways that we have devised to encounter new viruses. But that's not enough. There are two big components of emergence. One is encounter. The other is uh, the genetic diversity. Here's an example of both. This is the Amazon north region of Brazil. Okay, South America, Brazil, Amazon north expanded here. And these are some of the viruses that we know inhabit animals in this area. Many more than 183 arthropod-borne and other vertebrate viruses. Some of them have been isolated. You can see the, the, the dengue virus, four serotypes in different places here, but also many other. These are all virus names, exotic virus names. And some of these have been isolated. What does this mean? Well, there's a huge diversity of viruses living in wildlife in parts of the world. And of course, the Amazon North region is being deforested. So people are going in here to work. They're going to get their viruses and bring them back into the cities and towns. And so as the more we encroach upon these infected animals, the more we're going to get their infections. That's just one example where we happen to know a lot of the viruses that are present. Here's a, a list of some uh, emerging infections that we recognized and some of the factors that lead to emergence, 
like dengue viruses, you know, any conditions favoring mosquito breeding, like tires and also population growth. Ebola virus contact with a, with an unknown natural host, possibly bats, perhaps non-human primates. Hantaviruses, agriculture, and human rodent contact during the rice harvest in many Asian countries that allows viruses to be transmitted from the rodents. Uh, Hendrovirus, proximity of fruit bats near stables, for example. We'll talk about that today. HIV-1, hunting and butchering of infected primates or bushmeat trade. Influenza virus, its reservoir in aquatic birds and the expansion of bird and pig farming, which are hosts for these viruses. Middle East respiratory syndrome, coronavirus, camel husbandry, and their contact with humans. Nipah virus, again, the proximity of fruit bats to piggeries. SARS, classic SARS, number one, open air meat markets. C. nombre virus, driven by weather changes, which cause increasing in, in, in the numbers of deer mice. And, and subsequent contact with humans. West Nile, mosquito transmission from a bird reservoir and global travel bringing it to the U.S. from Israel in 1999. Zika virus, mosquitoes and global travel. And then we have SARS-CoV-2. What factor led to its emergence? We're not really sure yet. We have to see where it came from. It likely came originally from a bat, but how it got into people, we don't know. We'll have more to talk about that later. All right, so there's the one role on the one hand of humans making opportunities to encounter new viruses. And most people don't think about this. They go about their daily lives. They don't even think that they're going to be encounter viruses yet. They emerge and they have huge impacts, as we can see now. At some point, we're going to have to do something about this. The other factor, of course, is evolution. And remember last time we talked about the enormous diversity present in a virus quasi-species. Many of these emerging viruses are RNA viruses. Their populations are incredibly diverse. And so you have various animal, non-human animal species harboring their own viruses in huge numbers. And somewhere in that diversity of viruses in those animals, there's a virus that could infect a human, perhaps, just randomly arising by the enormous diversity of mutation that occurs during replication. So the quasi-species, incredibly important in driving this. And I, I want to emphasize, this is a completely random event. The mutants arise. There is no goal on the part of the virus. The mutants are just arising, and they happen to, say, bind a human receptor and allow entry into human cells, and then selection takes over. It's completely random. Now, our travel, our anthropogenic activities is not random that allow us to encounter animals. We could control that, but this we can't control. And this happens randomly because viruses need this diversity, as we talked about last time. Uh, before we go into some examples of emerging infections, let's talk about the general categories of the interactions between hosts and their viruses that we know about. There are four I want to talk about. and They're shown here on this graph and how they relate to one another on this graphic. We have stable virus-host relationships here in green. This is what maintains the virus in an ecosystem. In humans, think of herpes viruses or measles viruses or rhinoviruses, many, many others. They're human viruses. They are stable in us, and we transmit it to other humans. We could transmit those viruses to other species, which might lead to some of these other categories, like evolving virus-host relationships. This is when viruses pass to a naive population an immunologically naive population that has never seen that virus before. It could be other humans, could be a, a group of humans living somewhere that's never encountered the virus that you have, or it could be a different species entirely. And it can go from animals to us. The stable doesn't have to be in humans. It could be in bats, and they give us their viruses. So that's evolving relationship because once the virus comes into a new host, it evolves for some time before it may stabilize. And these are where many emerging infections come from. Then we have dead-end infections, a one-way passage to a different species. So this can be from humans to non-humans or vice versa. The virus enters a different host where it's not normally, and that's it. May replicate in that host, may or may not make it sick. It's not transmitted. End of story. Dead-end. It's quite clear. 
And finally, a, re a resistant host where there's no infection whatsoever, an insect virus passing through our intestines, right? When we eat cabbage that has insect viruses on it, that we're a resistant host for that virus, nothing happens. It just passes through us. These kinds of resistance encounters can come from stable or evolving interactions. All right, so let's look at some of these in a little more detail. Let's look at the stable host virus interactions. These are where both participants survive and multiply. The virus proliferates in the host without wiping out the host because the host is needed, of course, and the host evolves to be able to deal with the virus. And some of these are very permanent, as you might gather. We've already mentioned measles virus, herpes simplex viruses, smallpox viruses were the only host and the virus exists in us. We've been able to eradicate smallpox simply by vaccination campaigns because we're the only host for the virus. It's a good example of what happens when the virus no longer has a host because of immunity. It's gone. And sometimes these stable interactions uh, may include infection of more than one species. So influenza viruses goes among humans and birds and pigs, for example. Flavy and toga viruses, all uh, multi-host stable interactions. And again, these stable interactions can seed to resistance, evolving, and dead-end uh, interactions as well. Then we have the evolving host virus relationship here in yellow. The hallmarks instability, unpredictability. And, you know, you can go from a stable to an evolving interaction, even from a dead end to an evolving, but more rarely. The major pathways here are in red. And this can have any, any range of outcome from benign to death. So we have some examples here. Uh, smallpox and measles viruses introduced to natives of the Americas by old world colonists and slave traders that wiped them out because they'd never seen it before. They had zero population immunity because of the effect of barriers to travel in those days, which don't exist anymore. West Nile coming to the Western Hemisphere in 1999, highly evolving and unstable relationship until it spread across the country and, and had established infection for a few years in native birds, of course, not in people. And the introduction of myxoma virus to eliminate rabbits into Australia, very different outcomes in the first year versus the subsequent year. So that's what we mean by instability and unpredictability. And then we have our dead end interaction, uh, which is a very frequent outcome of a zoonotic spillover, a cross-species infection. This happens often, very often, far more than we know. You have a stable virus-host relationship and the virus spills over into a dead-end host. There is typically no sustained transmission from these new infected hosts to others of the same species. No sustained transmission. That's the key. It can transmit. You can have short chains of infections, but they're never becoming a human virus. They never become a stable interaction in this new virus host system. Ebola virus is a good example of this. Dead end hosts are humans, chimps, and gorillas. We believe these viruses are acquired from bats. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And the chains of infection are typically not very long, although uh, in 2015 it was an unusual situation and there were some extended chains of infection. But typically these all end and then the next outbreak is a new zoonotic spillover. Influenza H5N1 virus, highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses found in birds globally and rarely come into humans, but very, very short chains of infection, dead-end infections. These contribute little to the spread of the natural infection. It is the stable and, to a lesser extent, the evolving relationships that contribute to the spread of viruses in nature. And here are some examples of stable and dead-end host virus relationships using uh, two different virus host systems. Now, here we have a, a virus uh, which is spread by mosquitoes uh, among wild birds. So this mosquito uh, bites a wild bird and picks up the virus and can deliver it to uh, another of the same species in a cycle from bird to bird. That could be West Nile virus. Sometimes the mosquitoes may bait my bite uh, domesticated birds like chickens. And sometimes other mosquito species can take a blood meal on this particular host and spread the virus to other hosts as well. So this is a stable host-virus relationship. Typically, the hosts are fine 
with the virus. They don't get sick. These are longstanding infections that have evolved for many, many years. In some cases, these mosquitoes may bite other hosts that are not part of this stable host virus cycle. For example, uh, these are arboviruses uh, that uh, can be transmitted to horses and cause encephalitis or even humans. These are dead-end hosts. Although these animals may get sick, they don't all get sick. The infection can range from benign to serious. They don't produce enough virus so that if a mosquito bit them, it would be transmitted to someone else. These are dead-end hosts. They're not part of the natural host virus cycle. So that's in one example with a mosquito-borne virus. Here's another one with a tick-borne virus, just for some variety, tick-borne encephalitis virus, which is involved in a stable host virus relationship with rodents. So the ticks pick up virus when taking a blood meal from a rodent, can spread it to another rodent. The mice get infected. They don't get sick typically. They can give a blood meal to another tick and the infection will be perpetuated in this tick-rodent cycle. And these viruses can also spread transovarially in ticks. So the eggs of a female tick can harbor the virus. And when the female lays eggs and they hatch into new ticks, ticks or they develop into new ticks, the ticks will have the virus and those virus, those ticks can go on and bite other rodents. Occasionally, the tick will bite a human, transmit the infection, can range from benign to serious, but again, the human is a dead-end host. Humans can also acquire the infection by drinking milk from another dead-end host. The cow that's been bitten by a tick develops an infection. The virus goes in the milk and if you drink it, you can get infected. But again, you're a dead-end host. You don't spread it to anyone else. So that really nicely illustrates both stable and dead-end relationships. Now let's talk in general about emerging infections. Before we go into some specific examples, there are two steps involved for the emergence of a new virus infection. Obviously, the first is the introduction. So a human has to encounter a non-human animal that has a virus in it. And those animals, as we said, have enormous genetic diversity in their viromes. And so perhaps in that diversity is one that's able to infect the human. So that's the key. You have genetic diversity of the virus and you have an encounter. You have to have an encounter. If there's no encounter, you will never see the infection. And that's why we have more and more encounters these days because our population is is growing incredibly. We're all over the place and making all sorts of changes of the types that we mentioned. All right, so that's the introduction. But then the infection has to become established and disseminate in the human population. It doesn't help if the virus infects one people and that's the end. It will never spread. Well, it does help us, of course. We don't want that to spread. Uh, but for the virus, uh, it's not going anywhere. That's the end of the infection. However, the virus exists in its natural host, so it doesn't really matter. You can see there's all accidents. These are all accidents with the exception of us building the encounters. So two steps, introduction, establishment, and dissemination. Most of the time, as I said, these rare encounters of viruses with new hosts, we never detect them. I'm sure they happen way more frequently than we know, but we we don't try to detect them. We don't try and detect every virus that we encounter all the time. And some of us are encountering more than others, depending on where we live, for example. But most of them never go anywhere. In fact, 99.999% of these chance encounters never go anywhere. You may have infection of a single host, so the virus may never even replicate in the host, but it may replicate in that host. It might not be transmitted. It might not replicate to high enough titers. Maybe it's not well adapted. It will not be shed. It won't be transmitted to others. And we will tell the story of how SIV went from a chimp to a human and became HIV. But it's thought that there were many spillovers of SIV from chimps into humans over the years, and most of them didn't go anywhere. And a few conditions were met, the perfect storm, if you will, that led to the emergence of HIV. And of course, horses, pigs, chickens, bats, they can all be sources of viruses that uh, we encounter. And mosquitoes and other biting insects may do the same. The, the successful encounters, the ones that lead to further replication, of course, the virus has to have access to both susceptible and permissive tissues and cells. If it doesn't, that will be the end of the infection. 
for transmission to a larger population, population density and health, the overall health of the population are, in fact, are important factors, of course. If a farmer in a field picks up a virus, it may infect him and his family, but if that family is alone and doesn't travel much, it will never go anywhere else. And there are probably many, many examples of such localized infections. In the end, you, the virus will endure only if it causes serial infections or chains of transmission. And most animal viruses, non-human animal viruses, are simply not able to sustain these chains of transmission. We know this because we see examples in Ebola viruses, West Nile virus, MERS coronavirus. We know that chains of transmission don't occur. And what allows viruses to make these chains of transmission, what are the changes that go from a rodent virus to a serially transmitted human virus, we have no idea. Because often we don't have the virus just before it's able to serially transmit in humans. It would be very nice to have those, but we need to do a, a lot more wildlife surveillance than we're doing these days. So let's talk about some examples of viral emergence. Uh, and here are two viruses that are well known to humans that originated in non-human animals, smallpox virus, the virus that's been eradicated. If we look at the genomes of uh, all the pox viruses that we know of, including smallpox viruses and all the others that infect many other animals on the planet, and we look at the speciation of their hosts, we think that this virus emerged three to 4,000 years ago in Eastern Africa in the red circle here, and we think it was transmitted to humans from camels. Now, camels were introduced to Africa 3,500 to 4,500 years ago. They originated uh, in North America, and they were brought south and across the land bridge you know, into Asia and the African region. And so we think uh, these camels were, were brought here. They encountered gerbils, a rodent here, uh, which, are, which occupy this hatched area of the middle region of Africa here. We think that camels were infected with a, a smallpox ancestor from gerbils, uh, and then the camels passed it on to humans. And we can deduce this by all the phylogenies that have been done. So that's a smallpox virus. Again, came from an animal. It didn't arise in humans. Measles virus, a similar story. Measles virus is very closely related to uh, a virus of cows, called rinderpest virus. And we think measles virus of humans, human virus, it's only a human virus, probably evolved from an ancestral rinderpest when humans first began to domesticate cattle in the 11th to 12th century. So we started the transition from hunter-gatherers to people living in larger and larger collections and that was made possible by agriculture to feed everyone and by raising animals like cows for milk and for meat. Started raising animals like cows. We got their viruses. They had their viruses long before humans. And we think measles established in the Middle East when human populations began to congregate in cities. Cities only made possible by farming, by agriculture, to have the food to feed those cities. Because remember, before we were hunter-gatherers, we went out and got our food. If you're now living in a big city population, you can't go out and get your food anymore. Too much competition, it's too far away, etc. So you need farming. And me measles maintenance requires very large populations. So this could only happen when, when the numbers uh, got to those levels. And then it emerged in the Middle East and sp was spread around the world by colonization and migration, reached the Americas in the 16th century, and essentially destroyed uh, many Native Americans who had never seen it before. Again, it arose in the Middle East, and it was transported around the world. And that leads us to diseases of exploration and colonization, which are really good examples of how the introduction of a new virus into a naive population can have devastating consequences. And this is a human virus. So this is smallpox and measles, but here we're focusing on smallpox. And we're looking at how when you introduce a virus into a naive population, devastating consequences. So smallpox uh, reached Europe first from the Far East. Remember, we, we said it emerged uh, in Eastern Africa in camels. It then reached Europe 
started causing big epidemics because lots of concentrated numbers of people. And then it was brought over to the New World. It was actually imported uh, into the Aztec region uh, from Hispaniola in 1520, and it killed three and a half million Aztecs. And that's why Cortez was able to con conquer the Aztecs because he had no military prowess. Uh, they were all sick. Most of them were dead. And so this changed the balance of human populations. Viruses have changed history. We seem to be changing it, in fact, today as we speak. So examples of uh, introduction of a new virus into the same species, humans to humans in this case. Then there are changes in human populations and environments that allow virus uh, spread. And I think a wonderful example of this is poliomyelitis. Poliomyelitis has been recorded since ages ago, thousands of years ago. This Egyptian carving from 1500 BC shows a priest with a withered leg with a drop foot. That's exactly what polio does. And there are all sorts of records in history of sporadic cases of polio for 4,000 years. So this is a virus that entered humans a long time ago, we don't know what the source was, and it entered into a stable virus-host relationship and just caused a case here, a case there. There are probably many, many cases of infection, right? Because we know that paralysis is only one in a hundred infections. So there are lots of infections, lots of spread, fecal-oral spread of this virus. But suddenly, at the end, at the beginning of the 1900s, this virus started to cause epidemics of bigger and bigger size, until in the U.S. alone, 20 to 30,000 cases. And of course, we developed vaccines to deal with this. But it changed. What changed in the beginning of the 20th century that made this from a sporadic disease to an epidemic one? This would be called today an emerging virus infection. The pattern is completely different. Even though it's the same disease, it went from sporadic to epidemic. Well, this is a disease of modern sanitation. And here's the idea. Before 1900, the virus circulated freely. When you were born, you got infected. There were feces everywhere. You had contact immediately with contaminated feces. You got poliovirus. But guess what? Your maternal antibodies prevented you from getting paralysis. You get a mild infection. You develop lifelong immunity. And that was the end of it. But what happened? Well, around 1900, the greatest invention of mankind ever, the toilet and sewers. That kept the feces off the streets. Now, infection is delayed until later in life. And now you have thousands and thousands of kids that didn't encounter feces early in their life. They're susceptible to polio. A virus, the virus is introduced into them. Boom, epidemic polio. Very simple explanation, a delayed infection because of modern sanitation. If there had been genome sequencing in 1908, would the emergence of epidemic polio have been blamed on mutation? Absolutely. That's all we do today. Whenever a virus changes in some way, we blame the genome without looking elsewhere because it's a little harder to look elsewhere. These kinds of studies are difficult. It's too easy to blame the genome. And I can guarantee you that every property is not just the genome, but it's something else like this. That's why this is a great example. Another example of environmental changes that lead to virus emergence, here's a good one where the changing climate leads to changes in animal populations, and that causes infections of humans. And this is hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, a very serious respiratory disease first noted in the Four Corners area uh, here in 1993, where these four states come together. There's a place called Four Corners. There's actually a plaque. You can go step on it if you want. And this disease emerged around there. These are young people who are getting s severe and lethal respiratory disease. Nobody had any clue where it was coming from. It turned out to be caused by a virus, which eventually got the name C. nombre virus. It turned out to be endemic in the deer mouse, Paramiscus maniculatus. 
These are just mice running around the woods. People started looking. They found the virus in them, the same virus that had caused the disease in humans. And it turns out if you catch these mice randomly, 30% of them are virus positive. Now, this virus, C. number, was originally called Muerto Canyon because that's the name of the area where the original cases were. But the residents didn't like having a name, a virus named after their town. So the CDC went through a couple of names and they didn't like any of them. Finally, they just said C. nombre, which I think is a wonderful way to say, ah, no, fine. You don't want a name? We'll give it no name. Anyway, this turns out to be a Bunya virus. It's an enveloped RNA virus with three single-stranded RNA segments. And these are present all over the world. There are human versions and there are mouse versions and many others as well. Why did this emerge though? What was the reason? These viruses have always been in mice, but why this year? In 1992, there was abundant rainfall, more than usual, and this resulted in a large crop of pinon nuts, which people and mice like, like to eat. So the mice population rose in numbers, and that made it more likely that they would have contact with humans. They go in humans' houses, they nest under the floor, and the virus is excreted in their feces. And so the mouse feces contaminates blankets or dust. You know, if you, if you have mouse feces, they dry out, and then you go and you vacuum it or brush it up. You aerosolize the virus, you inhale it, and then the virus infects your lungs. So more mice, more mouse feces, more opportunities for human infection. Now, we are not the natural host. The mouse are the natural host. The mice are natural hosts for this virus. They're fine with it. They excrete it. We pick it up accidentally. And in this case, it was because the mouse population went up. But it's a rare disease, and it does not spread from person to person. It's a zoonotic spillover. Every human infection is a zoonotic spillover. And looking back at human sera, it was clear that there were cases as far back as 1959. We just didn't know what they were. Here's a summary of U.S. cases as of January 2017, 728 cases. And you can see most states have cases, the numbers in parens. We've got a couple here in New York. And some of these happen when people go camping and they, they, they put their tent on these wooden platforms and the mice are underneath it and they inhale aerosolized feces many cases in homes where mice have dropped feces. So if you have mice in your house or apartment and you have feces, don't just sweep it up because you're going to aerosolize the dried feces. You, you want to wet it first so that you don't put the virus in the air. You should be careful. Anyway, this uh, virus is not just in the deer mouse. It's in the white-footed mouse. It's in the rice rat and the cotton rat. And here's the range of Paramiscus maniculatus in the U.S. and Canada and Mexico. So a very large range, one of the many hosts of these hantaviruses. So will this become a human virus? Who knows? Who knows if the changes will be sustained? If some mouse somewhere will have a virus that can infect people, there probably already are. It's just a matter of encounters. It has to happen. And the more our population grows, the more we're going to encounter mice. In fact, we're going to see shortly that bats are a big source of viruses. So are mice. Bats are the second most numerous mammal on the planet after humans. But mice are numerous also. And we don't have really an idea of the viruses that they carry and what kind of threat they may pose to us. Nobody wants to spend money to learn this. Okay, now let's talk about bats and viruses. Bats are a wonderful, well, wonderful is not the right word, a major source of zoonotic infections. This is a flying fox. Look at this. This can be three feet from top to bottom. It's Dracula embodied. Many, many new viruses have been found in, in bats in particular. Uh, flying foxes like this one have had two major human pathogens, Nipah and Hendra viruses found in them. These cause disease not only in humans, but in horses and pigs. And a study done in 2014 found 66 new paramyxoviruses from 119 bat and rodent species. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So Nipah and, and Hendra are paramyxoviruses. Do you remember a paramyxovirus? Measles virus, envelope negative strand RNA virus. Let's explore this a bit. Let's start with Hendra virus. 
enters a town on the northeast coast of, of Australia. In 1994, some racehorses started getting sick. They got encephalitis and they, 14 of them died. And one of their trainers, you know, racehorses you take care of, you get close to them, you can get infected with their viruses. And one trainer died. And this virus was named Hendra virus after the town. I guess they don't mind having a virus named after them. It turned out that Hendra virus was present in those bats we just saw, flying foxes. And what we did was we built horse stables near the where the bats live. And the bats fly into the stables and contaminate them with their viruses. The horses get infected, and then the horses spread the viruses to humans. And these, these infections continue, and they continued for a number of years. Uh, finally, a vaccine was developed for horses specifically. Uh, because there are not enough cases in humans to justify making a human vaccine. But, you know, racehorses are quite uh, expensive and uh, worth a lot of money, and people want to protect them. So a vaccine was developed to protect the horses, which also protects people, right? And that's called a one-world health approach. One world means we're all in this together, humans and non-human animals. And if we protect one, we protect the other. And so this Hendra vaccine is a one-world vaccine. By the way, this map shows the outbreaks of Hendra virus. Uh, they've been along the coast of Australia here, not just in Hendra. And the virus we're going to talk about next, Nipah, has also been in this area and bounded by the blue line. This is the range of the flying foxes. Flying foxes live in all this area within here. So potentially all these countries and areas are at risk for infection with Hendra. And the next virus we'll talk about, which is Nipah virus. So Nipah virus caused an outbreak in Malaysia and Singapore in 1998 in pig farms. So it started in the Perak region of Malaysia up here. Suddenly pigs were getting sick, displaying weird respiratory and neurological disease. Uh, it, it spread south in Malaysia here. And then eventually there was an outbreak in Singapore. And what happened was Singapore was importing pigs from Malaysia. They were importing infected pigs. They didn't know about it. And uh, eventually this was, uh, this was stopped by killing a million pigs, essentially, in, in Malaysia, which was highly unfortunate because that's a big source of protein for the country. But uh, this stopped the outbreak. And there were 105 human deaths associated with that, people taking care of the pigs and their families and so forth. I went to a meeting in, in uh, December in Singapore, which was the 20th a year after the discovery of Nipah virus and all the science that was being done on the virus since then, quite interesting. And again, what happens here is this virus is present in fruit bats, the flying foxes that we encountered. They're fine, just like they're fine with Hendra virus. They excrete the virus in their urine. Uh, these pig pens are near where the, where the uh, bats live. And in fact, next lecture, we'll talk about the ecology and what went on here to, to make the bats fly near the pig pens. The farmers had mango trees uh, near the pig pens, and, the, and the, the bats flew to the mango trees to eat their fruit bats. They like to eat fruit. So the uh, bats spread the virus to pigs. The pigs spread them to humans, and the humans got sick. So that has been stopped. So there's, there's no more NEPA in pigs. They've taken measures to make sure the bats don't get into the piggeries. However, these infections continue uh, in India and Bangladesh, and it's been traced to the consumption of date palm sap. So palm trees have sap, of course, like trees do, and people like to drink it. So they put these taps in the trees, and they leave them on for a couple of days. And it turns out that bats like to come at night and drink the sap as well. And while they're drinking, they're urinating into the sap and putting... Nipah virus in, and that gives you outbreaks of um, Nipah in these countries. There are some outbreaks, however, that are not connected with date palm sap consumption. So there's a, some other kind of contact between bats and people uh, that's going on here uh, that we don't know about. And in some cases, there are uh, there are examples of human to human transmission, uh, but not extensive change. Eventually, they die. So these become these don't become human. Infections, they don't become human viruses, but maybe they might at one point when they sustain the right changes. Who knows? So we should be ready. 
you know, but most of the world doesn't worry about this because the fruit bats are not in many other places. But it's a, clearly a threat to India and Bangladesh, and it's difficult for them to develop their own vaccines and antivirals. And so a nonprofit called CEPI, C-E-P-I dot org, a number of years ago raised money and has developed a vaccine for Nipah virus, which they have funded on donations. And they're going to bring it through a phase one trial and be ready for an outbreak. And this is what we need for the future. We can't depend on for-profit companies to make drugs and vaccines to save our lives because they only care if they can make money. And this nonprofit approach, this is going to gain traction now with the current outbreak because we should have been ready for this as well. So let's continue with bats, Ebola viruses. Ebola virus is a member of the family Filoviridae. And the, f the first outbreaks with virus of this family occurred in Germany, actually. They had imported uh, primates for research from Uganda. And the primates were infected with Marburg virus. That's where the primate lab was in Germany, Marburg. So they called the virus Marburg virus, uh, and it killed a number of workers. And that was our first introduction to the filoviruses. Uh, and subsequently, we learned that the, the monkeys imported had caused that outbreak. And then in 1976, a, an outbreak by uh, another filovirus, this Ebola virus, in DRC in, in Sudan. And I, I interviewed Fred Murphy, who was involved with the CDC at uh, taking the first pictures of Ebola virus. You may have seen these iconic filamentous pictures, electron micrographs. He took those pictures. He's now a retired virologist in Maryland. And and one day when people lose interest in coronas, I'll release that TWIV. This is a fascinating story. Anyway, there have been outbreaks of Ebola virus over the years, mostly in Africa, mostly in Central Africa, rarely elsewhere. Uh, the one in Eastern Africa was, was very unusual, as you will see. Uh, but these have been relatively small, a few hundred cases. And then the one in, in 2015 in East Africa was over 26,000 cases. And there are four sp species of uh, Ebola viruses. Most of the outbreaks are the Zaire Ebola virus here in red and uh, Sudan, a few here. DRC, there's currently an ongoing outbreak. Uh, and every outbreak is started by a new zoonotic spillover. Again, this does not become a human virus. These are dead-end infections. So Ebola viruses, of course, are filoviridae. They're filamentous, very unusual for eukaryotic virus. Negative strand RNA genome enveloped uh, particles with a glycoprotein and the glycoprotein is against which you would like to make your um, uh, antibodies. So the uh, vaccine we talked about, which is licensed, Ervibo, is the glycoprotein put in a VSV vector. Now, how do humans get infected with Ebola virus? This is a classic zoonosis. You have an index case, typically a contact with an animal carcass, not always identified, but we think that's the case. Bushmeat, people in Africa... Don't have always nice shopping centers to, to purchase their food at, so they hunt their food, and they will eat primates, They will non-human primates, they will eat bats, rodents, and if these have Ebola viruses in them, they start an outbreak. So the index case has contact, and then the virus is transmitted to others by close contact with infected fluids, typically families and, and doctors and nurses that care for the sick people. These chains of infection are typically short, are not of about two, and they require close contact. No droplet transmission like SARS-CoV-2. Although if you're intubating someone and you're making an aerosol, that aerosol could spray some distance and hit a close-by healthcare worker, for example. Some examples of how these start in 1996 in Gabon, 37 cases, a chimp found dead in the forest was eaten by people hunting for food. And then 18 people who were involved in butchering the animal became ill, and 10 other cases occurred in their family members. This is a very typical scenario. Family members get infected. And if the outbreak can be identified, it can be contained. You do infection control, and you can limit the outbreak. But these are all very close contact with one another. Gabon, 96.7. Again, 60 cases. The index was a hunter who lived in a forest camp. A dead chimp was found in the forest at the time and it found to be infected with Ebola virus. But again, we don't know if that particular case, the, the hunter actually had eaten or touched that dead chimp. We're, we're unable to get that information. So there's always this circumstantial evidence. 
but we don't often have a smoking gun to identify where the virus came from. Now, in 2015, there was a huge, the biggest ever outbreak in West Africa, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia. But it began uh, here in Guinea in uh, December 2013 to February 2014. And so the first case was this two-year-old child who got sick on December 2nd and died four days later. Fever, black stool vomiting. And that child transmitted it to her sister, her mother, her grandmother, a nurse, and a village midwife. They all died. The midwife transmitted it to other villages. There to the left, there down here. And that started other chains of infection. So all of this wonderful epidemiology, this contact tracing was done to sort this out after the fact. In fact, it was three months before anyone knew this was Ebola virus. And by then, this had spread extensively because it had never happened in this part of Africa before. So it wasn't thought to be an issue. So they didn't know what this was. They thought it could be malaria or some other hemorrhagic disease. Three months later, finally, they figure out it's Ebola. And by then, so many people are infected that you get uh, all these transmissions and short chains of infections. But you can see family members, healthcare workers, and funerals. People attending funerals, often these people prepare the, the bodies of their family members. And they get infected. And that's how you control infection. You control it in the hospital. You control it at home. You control it uh, in the burial stage. So this ended up being over 26,000 cases. It was a real serious uh, outbreak. Now, this virus, we think, comes from bats, but very difficult to prove. The Marburg virus, which was involved in that German outbreak in a primate center, the virus itself has been isolated from the cave-dwelling fruit bat, Rosatus aegyptiacus. So there the virus has been isolated. So that's pretty clear that that bat is a host for Marburg. And so this bat must transmit it to uh, primates and, and infect them. Uh, but the problem is uh, Ebola viruses. We're not sure. The RNA and antibodies to the virus have been found in three tree-roosting bats. They haven't found infectious virus. It's very difficult to do these studies. It's not easy to catch bats. It's dangerous. You have to go into caves when you, you, know, you could get infected, so you have to be all, all suited up. So I'm not sure we'll ever have infectious virus, but the idea is that it's likely in a bat or bats, and humans, gorillas, chimps are dead-end hand, dead end hosts. We know that chimps are killed by it, gorillas are killed by it, and somehow it goes from uh, one to the other. And this is the scenario. Bats are the reservoir, multiple reservoirs, possibly different species, uh, and these can spill over periodically uh, into chimps uh, and gorillas, who then can infect humans. So we can get it by bushmeat hunting of chimp and gorilla, or even bat eating hunting for bats. And if they're infected, we get the infection. And then we transmit it in short chains among each of us. And so that's the current idea for that. But the key here is that every infection is a brand new spillover. As I said, human to human transmission, contact with infected blood or body fluids. All of these fluids have virus in them typically from a very sick person or someone who has died during burial preparations. Uh, also, needles, syringes have transmitted the disease. And it's not by insects, not by water, not by food, not by aerosol. So none of these droplets will transmit unless, as I said, you're doing a medical procedure and you generate these large droplets. If you're standing right over a patient and they expel these droplets onto you, you will be infected, but it's not what we consider aerosol transmission. It's a procedure. If you're walking around breathing, you're not going to transmit Ebola virus. The virus enters at mucosal surfaces, respiratory, for example, or if you have breaks in your skin, it can be injected by a needle, and you can find, again, virus in all of these fluids, and so contact with any of those will transmit infection. Incubation period ranging from 2 to 21 days, and during this period, you're not contagious. You're not shedding virus in sufficient quantities to infect someone else. Very different from SARS-CoV-2, 1 to 14-day incubation, and in many cases, you're shedding virus. Multi-system infection, systemic involvement, gastrointestinal involvement, respiratory system, vascular system, neurological system. The virus not only replicates in many, many tissues, but also 
uh, induces an immune response that is overabundant and can't be controlled. 30 to 90 percent case fatality ratio in Africa. Uh, we know that you can actually have a lower case fatality ratio by proper medical care. So if these patients are cared for in a certain way, they can be saved. Uh, but this is a, a very f a typical feature of a zoonotic spillover, a virus going into a brand new host where it's not evolved for many years and very, very serious disease. Okay, another bat infection, SARS-1, classic SARS. This begins in February 2003. This is a text of a ProMed Mail post. If you, if you haven't looked at promedmail.org, wonderful place to learn all about outbreaks of everything that are happening in the world. And this February, a, a doctor had sent an email. This morning I received an email and searched your archives on ProMed, found nothing that pertained to it. Does anyone know anything about this problem? And here was the email this doc had received. Have you heard of an epidemic in Guangzhou? An acquaintance of mine from a teacher's chat room lives there and reports that the hospitals have been closed and people are dying. February, nobody knew anything about this. That's the first uh, information we got about SARS. So SARS is severe acute respiratory syndrome, which now nobody needs to be told, but back then no one knew about it and we forgot quickly. It began with an outbreak of severe atypical pneumonia unknown etiology in the south of China in November. So we didn't find out until months later. 305 cases, five deaths initially. Short incubation period, fever, chills, headache, malaise, myalgia, typical flu-like syndromes, and then moving into another phase, which included shortness of breath, and 10 to 20% of the patients uh, may require mechanical ventilation. Sound familiar? So that's the beginning, November 2002. Now, in uh, February, this Chinese doctor had treated some of the first patients in the outbreak. He traveled to Hong Kong on February 21st, 2003, stayed on the ninth floor of the Metropole Hotel. This is the Metropole Hotel. It has become infamous because of this incident. The next day, he died in the hospital. He got sick quickly and went to the hospital. He died. However, in the short time he was there, he spread his infection to 10 other people in the hotel, and they flew on to Singapore, Vietnam, Canada, the U.S., before they had symptoms, and they brought the virus to those different countries. And he probably just walked by them or was in the elevator with them. He was a super spreader. He infected 10 people. That's the definition of a super spreader. He was probably shedding a lot of virus. and infected them readily. Eventually, this infection spread to 8,000 people, 29 countries, 10% mortality. I like to show this, this travel poster, which was issued at the time. Hong Kong will take your breath away. Indeed. So what is the outbreak all about? Here's the, the case reports. This is the epi curve. The number of cases you can see from February 23, peaking in March. Outbreak is over July 2003. Never seen again. Never, the virus never found again anywhere except in labs in the world. And that's why people, I guess, at the beginning of SARS-CoV-2 didn't take it all that seriously because this one had ended. We thought that this one would end as well. So here are the cases, 8,000, 10% case fatality. Vast majority, of course, uh, in China. Hong Kong, a few other Asian countries, Australia, just a few, Europe, very few, U.S., very few. Uh, so this is really very different, of course, from uh, what's happening now. Now, this was virus was eventually isolated. It turned out to be a coronavirus, which was a shock to everyone at the time. Why? Because we had known of two coronaviruses up until this point. They were isolated in the 60s. They caused common colds. This is the first time an epidemic coronavirus that caused serious illness had been identified. So this awakened the world to coronaviruses. Where did this virus come from? Well, human sera that were collected before the outbreak, this was all done after it, of course, they were found not to contain antibodies to SARS coronavirus. So this was something new. And the earliest cases in the south of China were in handlers of animals for the open food market where they sell meat typically bringing meat in from farms or from animals that are captured 
and they're butchered and they are sold. And these people are obviously exposed to blood and they can get infected. So they had the earliest cases and these animal traders had significantly higher prevalence of antibodies to the virus than control groups. So this said, ah, it must be in one of these animals uh, in, these, in these meat markets. And so the story evolved even further. So people started doing wildlife studies and they found uh, in caves in Yunnan province, highly diverse SARS-related coronaviruses in horseshoe bats. This is a horseshoe bat right here. All of the genetic diversity needed to make SARS coronavirus were found in, the, in this one cave. So you have the genome of SARS-CoV and you can find all its pieces in viruses isolated from bats in this cave. However, no one found any one SARS coronavirus in any bat that was exactly the same or close to what was in people. That coupled with the fact that there were no SARS cases in Yunnan province, okay, that's where the cave is with all this viral diversity, no SARS cases during the outbreak. So obviously it started in the south. So the hypothesis emerged uh, that the progenitor emerged in bats by mutation and recombination. And then the bats infected civet cats. So the civet cats are sold in the market. These were found to be positive for a virus virtually identical to that which infects humans. So the civet cats were thought to be infected in the countryside by the bats. They were brought to the market. And then people, uh, well, the handlers, the meat handlers were infected by the civet cats. And that started the outbreak. And that's because, again, this virus is not found in the countryside. So it was brought in. And so the scenario is bat, civet cat, SARS-CoV. So that's a horseshoe bat and that's a civet cat. All right, let me see before we go on if there are, yeah, there are a lot of questions here. How do programs like PREDICT effectively sample for these quasi-species? Yeah, it's not, they're not perfect. So they look at wildlife and they can, they're limited in what they can do. Sequencing that doesn't reveal the quasi-species. They can just say, what's an average sequence? And then you can ask, do these viruses have the potential to infect human cells? So documented transmission of a plant virus to humans. I don't know of any, no. Are viruses with higher mutation rates more likely to establish in new species? Yes, most of these zoonotic spillovers are RNA viruses. Why can't someone with hantavirus spread virus to other people? Uh, you don't make enough virus. The, the virus titers aren't high enough in respiratory secretions. You know, it has to be well adapted to replicate in you. It has to replicate the high titers, and these viruses haven't done that. If vi human is the dead end, why do doctors need to track down every infectious case in quarantine? Because there is close contact in families, healthcare workers caring for patients, and they don't, no, they didn't know how to do infection control. So we had to track the cases and say, we have to isolate these patients. So it, I know it's misleading to say it's, it's a dead end, but if you contain those cases in hospital and you teach people not to touch the corpses when they bury and so forth, you can stop the infection because it's not able to transmit effectively. You have to have very close contact for it to transmit. How long can a virus particle remain infectious in droppings? Well, it depends on the virus. If it's enveloped, maybe a few days. Uh, if it's not enveloped, maybe months. How long can they survive on dead animal? Same thing. Weeks to months to years, depending on the virus. Would you agree with the suggestion of Peter Daszak that humans should stop eating bats? I don't think you can say that eating bats caused the outbreak. Uh, for the current virus, it might have happened in another way, and we'll, we'll talk about that. These Viruses don't necessarily come over by eating bats. If you stopped eating bats, I think there would still be spillovers. There are other ways. Do so many human viruses trace back to bats just because of the large size of the bat population? Yes, bats are 20% of all mammals, the most numerous mammals. They fly, so they have a big range, and they have more viruses than any other thing on the planet. Have people proposed a naming system for viruses separated from the location where they're identified? Yes, and then most viruses are named that way now. Is super spreading a function of merely social habits or is there something biological to it? Yeah, it's shedding. Super spreaders appear to make more virus per cell than other people and therefore your droplets have more virus in them. And even the tiniest droplets that you make that go farther seem to have more virus than normal and that's why they're super spreaders. How can you get uh, viruses from bushmeat if you cook it? 
Before you cook it, you have to prepare it, right? And that's when you contaminate yourself. It's like chicken. You know, chicken is full of bacteria. If you don't wash your hands after pulling the chicken out of the package, you're going to get infected. Same thing. All right, the next coronavirus, MERS coronavirus. A SARS-1 is gone. 2012, 60-year-old male patient dies of pneumonia and kidney failure. They get a virus out of him. They, gene, they sequence the genome. It's another coronavirus. It's not SARS, but it's a coronavirus. It binds a different receptor. So the SARS coronavirus receptor is ACE2, angiotensin-converting enzyme 2. And this one is dipeptidylpeptidase 4, another membrane-bound enzyme. Very interesting. So they call this Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. And again, phylogeny. Now, by now we have a bunch of coronaviruses from bats. It's closely related to bat coronaviruses. And so this case turns out that the virus went from bats to camels at some point. And then camels in camels, it is endemic, and particularly dromedary camels there with the one hump. Uh, All the camels in the Middle East and Africa appear to have MERS-like coronaviruses. Camels get infected at at a young age when they're born. They get a a mild respiratory disease, and then they recover, and they're okay. So they got this from bats a long time ago. You can trace the phylogeny. Then the, the camels spread it to humans. So most of these infections have been in the Middle East, of humans anyway. And there they raise camels. They race them. They have them as pets. They eat them. So there's a lot of human-camel contact, and so that's how the infection is generally spread. Typically, most of the patients are, have other health care issues, but not all infections have a camel source. So we think there's some people infected without symptoms that are spreading it, but we've never been able to identify that. Um, the, we don't know how it's transmitted to them if it's not a camel source. We don't know why so few humans are infected. It's not adapted to humans yet. It hasn't become a human virus. Every new case of this virus is a new spillover from camels. So it does not go human to human. So lots of interesting questions here. Whether it will, it's been going since 2000, or was the date, 2012. You'll see how many cases we have so far. Will it adapt to humans? Who knows? It might. I think we should be ready. We have a camel vaccine, which is being tested there are not enough cases of human disease to justify a human vaccine, but every camel is infected, so you could vaccinate them and um, prevent spread to human. Another one health approach, right? That would work. So this is still in testing. Uh, whether it's going to be widely accepted is not clear. Because again, the camels don't really get sick, so the people who are raising them may be re- reluctant to use it if, it, you know, if they have to pay for it and it doesn't help them in any way. So that should be interesting. So here's the transmission and geographic range. Um, it's the most recent numbers I could get through 2019. 2,500 cases, 858 deaths in 27 countries. And that's a 34% case fatality ratio. And you can see the epi curves, you know, there, there are bumps of cases. And it's been going down as we've getting better at recognizing and containing the infection. These colors tell you how these infections uh, occur. Most of them are camel. Well, camel to camel is the orange. I mean, camels in all these orange regions are positive for MERS coronavirus. It's a lot of camels. And then camel to human is the red, mainly in the Arabian Peninsula and short human to human chains, right? But then some infections have been exported to other countries, Morocco, parts of Europe, U.S., There was one in Korea, I believe it was back here. That that accounts for this big spike. I'm sorry, Korea is the red one here. See, Uh, so one patient was infected in the in Saudi Arabia, flew to Korea. He was fine. He got sick. He went into a hospital, and they didn't know what was wrong with him. So he infected lots of other people in hospital, and they went home and infected people. So that was that until they figured out how to contain it. So he he was probably a super spreader. Uh, so this human-human is typically in healthcare settings where they don't recognize the infection soon enough to contain it. Whether or not this becomes a human virus, we don't know. But I think we should have antivirals in case, but we really don't have anything that's been shown to be effective. Uh, and that brings us to how we started this course. 
SARS-CoV-2, the first pandemic of the 21st century, still ongoing as we speak here in uh, April, started with a cluster of pneumonia cases of unknown cause in Wuhan, December 2019. And initially, the Huanan seafood market was thought to be the beginning. Now, why? Because, well, SARS-1 started in an open meat market. Here at the seafood market, they sell meats as well as seafood. So they said, okay, maybe it happened here. And the first 40 cases or so are mapped on this epi curve, number of cases, and whether or not there was Huanan seafood market exposure. The very first case, December 1st, no seafood market exposure. And you can see half, almost half of the other cases, no seafood market exposure. But all the ones that were connected led people to think that it was the beginning, but it really was not the beginning. It's now accepted that this was not the beginning. Probably someone went there and spread the infection, but it started somewhere else. And as of today, two and a half million reported cases globally, 165,000 deaths. So this virus, of course, spread extensively within China, despite a lockdown and out of the country as well. And it has now reached many, many countries, and we're all trying to deal with this in different ways. Uh, the R naught is between two and three; is it's effectively spread, and and because eighty percent of infections are mild, this spreads silently, and you don't know that you're spreading it. You you don't feel sick, or, or you feel like you have a cold or just flu, and you're spreading the virus. So very difficult, very different from SARS one, where most patients were hospitalized. Over fifty percent of the infections ended up in hospital, and we could contain them there, and that's why that one was burned out. But this one has an insidious way of spreading because uh, most of the infections are quite mild. Where did this one come from? From the earliest cases in Wuhan, the virus was isolated. The genome was sequenced. And here it is on a phylogenetic tree of other alpha and beta coronaviruses. And I just want to point out, you know, coronaviruses of many different animals. And you can see here human coronavirus, OC43, 229E. These are common cold coronaviruses, NL63. There are four of them now. HKU1, that's the fourth. They're quite distant from the uh, original SARS-CoV-2. And here's uh, SARS coronavirus isolate in a civet. The civet isolate, you can see how close they are. SARS-1 and civet SARS and some bat SARS-like viruses. But here the SARS-CoV-2 is in a different branch of this tree. Not really that close to SARS-1, 80-some percent genome identity, but this virus has 96% nucleotide identity with a bat coronavirus called RATG13. This was identified, look at it right there, right next there on the same branch. This virus was identified in 2013 in a cave, in a bat cave in Yunnan province, a thousand miles outside of Wuhan. And so... This SARS-CoV-2 and RATG13 have a common ancestor. SARS-CoV-2 was not derived from RATG13. It couldn't have been. It's 4% difference, and this virus, RATG13, was identified in 2013. It's too long ago. Something else is the immediate precursor. We don't have it. But it clearly shares an ancestor with RATG13. This is a bad virus. There's no doubt about it. It wasn't made in the lab. It wasn't escaped from a lab. It came from nature. And a recent interesting analysis of recombination, it's a preprint found here. This is by Columbia professor Raul Rabadon from his laboratory, uh, shows that recombination was clearly involved in an ancestor of this virus to generate it. And this recombination encompasses the receptor binding domain. So here's the spike glycoprotein of SARS-CoV-2. And remember, uh, there's a domain called the receptor binding domain here in green. This binds ACE2 receptor. And this virus has high affinity RBD for ACE2. RATG13, which is the closest, has a, an RBD that can bind ACE2, but it's much lower affinity. So mutations, amino acid changes have been selected in SARS-CoV-2 that allow high affinity binding. And this RBD, by the way, can be tracked by recombination. So if you look at the phylog phylogeny of the whole genome, you find that this uh, SARS-CoV-2, the closest relative is bat RATG13. And human SARS is a bit farther away. But if you just look at the RBD in terms of phylogeny, now RATG13, SARS-CoV-2, and human SARS all 
uh, map together very closely on this phylogeny. And so uh, Raoul has come up with this scenario where there were recombination events in ancestors. And so here in red, there, there was possibly one before 2009 that introduced the receptor binding domain into RATG13 and the precursor of SARS-CoV-2. And so we can see that today in RATG13. And it further evolved in uh, SARS-CoV-2 to bind ACE2 very highly affinity, with a very high affinity. And where that happened, we don't know. It had to happen in uh, an animal with uh, a human ACE2-like receptor. And the other possibility is that the recombination event actually occurred before SARS-1 in 1992 or before. And this kind of analysis you can do by looking at recombination events and phylogenies and plotting them uh, with time. So it's quite clear that this is a virus of bad origin. How it got into Wuhan, we don't know. But sampling of wildlife for these viruses will likely provide an answer. And we need to do more of that. And so here's a summary of the origin of these human coronaviruses. They all came from nature. None of them came from a lab. You hear lots of conspiracy theories in the press. It came from a lab. Someone made it or someone worked with it and it got out. It's all baloney. It's all wrong. There are people who are doing that who don't understand virus evolution and phylo phylogenetic analysis. And so the four human common cold coronaviruses, 63229OC43, HKU1, they're all spillovers from animal viruses. Two from bats, and one went through uh, an intermediate host. The other is from a rodent virus to a cow to a human. And the other, we don't know what the intermediate is. But you see the pattern here. We always think the origin is one animal, and then it went through something else before getting to human. And question marks, we don't know what those intermediates are. SARS-CoV-1, bat to civet to human. MERS-CoV, bat, camel, human. There's even a pig coronavirus, severe acute diarrhea syndrome coronavirus, emerged in China a couple of years ago. It's a bat virus that became adapted to pigs and causes diarrhea in pigs. And then we have SARS-CoV-2, clearly a bat virus, now a human virus. If there is an intermediate host, we don't know it. Now, Someone said, why don't we stop eating bats? It's not clear that eating bats caused this. You see, none of these others was a direct introduction of virus into humans. We, don't, we have to find this intermediate, and that would solve this problem. But even if it turned out to go from bats to people, you don't have to eat the bat to get the infection. Many farmers in the country in China harvest bat guano from caves to use as fertilizer in their fields, and it could be that one of them got infected and brought the virus into Wuhan. We just don't know. So, you know, making blanket statements about cultural practices I don't think is useful. I think we need to sample wildlife and figure out this problem. A, f a few uh, last words here before I close. First of all, I went to Australia in 2014, and I, I interviewed Lin Fa Wang, who has since moved to Singapore, and I was his guest back in December. He studies bats and the viruses that infect them. Fascinating guy. Old Twiv. He's the real Batman. It's really cool. He's, he's so smart and really neat to hear his ideas about bats and viruses. And he's currently very tied up, of course, uh, SARS-CoV-2 in Singapore. And the other thing is, a lot of these viruses, how do you work on them? The highest containment laboratory is a BSL-4. And the, here you have to work on viruses like Nipah and Hendra and Ebola. Not SARS-CoV-2. You can work on BSL-3. But BSL-4... You have to wear these spacesuits. You have to have oxygen or air pumped into them. You have to go through a, an entry and exit procedure. And I was fortunate with some of my TWIV co-hosts to do a documentary in a BSL-4 in Boston called The Needle, National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratory. And so we called it, of course, Threading the Needle. You should really watch it. It is so cool. Nobody has ever done this because this, this lab was not open yet. So we were able to go in and film this documentary. Very cool. And so viruses with high mortality, person-to-person -person transmission, no approved vaccine or antiviral, uh, those are the ones you have to work on. And we have a, a number of these in the U.S., and people are working on viruses like Ebola and Lassa and Nipah and Hendra in them. Well, one last uh, series of uh, thoughts for you. 
So we've talked about, you know, how these emerging infections occur, what they do to people. How common are they? Well, I think dead ends are very common, as I said before. I think we're all infected frequently with viruses that never go anywhere. So ones that produce sustaining transmissions are very, very rare. So what we see today is an incredibly rare event, which just happened to have produced a virus in nature that encountered a human that spread. We can't predict them. We cannot predict what's going to happen. But we can know what's out there. We can sample wildlife and know what's out there, what has pandemic potential. And we can react. We can be prepared. We can say, let's have a pandemic plan. And if a new virus emerges, we're going to make sure we have personal protective equipment. We're going to make sure we have hospital capacity. We're going to make sure we have diagnostic capacity of all sorts. We had none of those. We have none of those for this outbreak. We were completely unprepared. And it's a shame because the U.S. and many other countries of the world are technologically wonderful. We can do any of this, and we didn't because we didn't want to spend the money. And it's a shame that people have to die because of that. It is really the tragedy here is that all of this could have been prevented. It's not anyone's fault. It just could have been prevented very soon after the first emergence in China. For example, we could have had pan-coronavirus antivirals. We talked about this briefly a couple of lectures ago. It would have been easy to sample all those SARS-like coronaviruses in bats and look at their RNA polymerases. They're, gonna, they're the most conserved protein in all these viruses. It would be a piece of cake to make a pan-RDRP antiviral. Nobody wanted to do it. Why not? Companies weren't interested. There was no money to make. Now they have, everybody's interested in antivirals and vaccines because there's money to make. It's kind of sad, isn't it, that our health depends on for-profit companies and they won't do anything for us until they can make money. So I think we have to change the way we make drugs and vaccines. We have to have nonprofits like CEPI doing it. And uh, this week I'm going to talk to a, a number of virologists who are starting another one of those nonprofits to try and be ready for the next pandemic. All right, so we're actually going to continue some of these ideas next time. There's a brand new lecture for this course, Ecology of Viruses, because spillovers depend a lot on the interaction of animals and viruses uh, with their environment. And so I'm going to try and portray to you how that works, not just for some of the viruses we've talked about, but for viruses in the oceans and viruses of plants and how their interactions are important.